Welcome everyone. During this lecture we'll be introducing inclined plane analysis, we'll discuss the subject of friction, and then we'll incorporate these two topics into an application that involves an inclined plane as well as friction. Let's begin by considering what happens when a block is situated along an inclined plane. So there's our block and you can see that the angle of inclination is denoted by theta and the block could be doing one of two things. It could either be in static equilibrium, in other words it's not moving, or it could be in a state of motion. Now if this block is in fact moving we have to note that the acceleration is actually taking place in two dimensions if we consider a horizontal and vertical Cartesian coordinate system. So again, if this mass is traveling along the incline, it's accelerating along the x-axis as well as the y-axis, which actually complicates our analysis. In order to simplify our analysis, what we will do is we will rotate the standard Cartesian coordinate system so that the x-axis lies along the incline. So let's draw a Cartesian coordinate system that does this for us. So there's our Cartesian coordinate system. Of course, this is the x-axis. This is our y-axis. Now, once we've introduced this Cartesian coordinate system, it turns out that the mass is only accelerating along the x-axis and not the y-axis, right? The mass, as it travels along the incline, has a constant y-coordinate. If we consider the reference location as the bottom of this block, then this block always has a y-coordinate of zero. And that means that the acceleration along the y-direction is zero. Now, as it travels along x, it may be speeding up, it may be slowing down. This means that we are going to experience an acceleration along the x-axis. Or the other possibility is that the block may be, like we mentioned earlier, static, or it may be traveling with constant velocity which still means that it's in static equilibrium but the point of rotating the two axes is to ensure that there is no acceleration along the y-axis. Now this introduces another issue and that is if we draw the weight vector, remember the earth is always pulling the block towards the center of the earth and if we were to draw the weight vector it would look like this. The problem with that is when we conduct our analysis, we would have to consider the x and y coordinates of this weight because now the weight is not aligned with the y-axis. And so to simplify our analysis, what we will do is we will break down this weight so that we can identify its x and y components. So let's go ahead and do that graphically first. If this is the weight vector, w, then the x component of weight looks like this. And we can label this as w sub x. And you can see that w sub x is aligned with the x-axis. Let's now introduce the y component of the weight. This is the y component, and we would label that as w sub y. And if you'll note, we can complete a triangle by just transferring wy to the left hand side of the diagram. This dotted line represents wy and what I'd like to do now is to identify one of the acute angles within this triangle that we have formed. And let me just emphasize the triangle with a highlighter. Again, we have a right triangle that we have formed uh, please note that this angle between WX and the dotted line is a 90 degree angle. So this blue triangle is a right triangle. And I would now like to identify one of the acute angles within this right triangle. So let's take a look at the following consideration. This angle is theta. Let's just imagine that this angle is, say, 30 degrees. If we take a look at another triangle namely this triangle right here. We can note that if this angle is theta within this new blue triangle, 
then the angle between Wx and W would be 90 minus theta. In other words, the two acute angles within a right triangle have to add up to 90 degrees. So if this angle is, for example, 30, the angle up here would have to be 60 degrees. They must add up to 90 degrees. Now, if this angle in here is 60, now the question is, what is the value of this angle within the smaller triangle that we defined earlier? Again, if this is 60, if we're considering the smaller triangle, the two acute angles must add up to 90. So if this is 60, the other acute angle is right here, this angle must equal 30. So we've drawn the relationship, we've drawn a connection between theta and this specific acute angle within the smaller triangle that we're interested in. In other words, if this angle is 30, this angle is 60, and if this is 60, then this is 30. Therefore, if the angle of inclination is 30, then the angle that we have identified within the small triangle is also equal to theta. And we can note that as follows. This angle in here equals theta. Now, let's draw the smaller triangle on the side so that we can analyze it. The smaller triangle looks like this. Here's Wx. Here's the weight vector. And here's W sub y. We also noted that this is the angle theta. Let's also note that W sub y is now the adjacent side, right? Adjacent means that the vector is bordering the angle, and that's what's happening in this case. And W sub x is the opposite side because it's remote from the angle. And now we can establish the trigonometric relationships between W, Wx, and Wy. Let's begin by first of all noting that the weight simply equals m times g. Next, from trigonometry, since Wx is the opposite side, it is related to the weight through the sine function. So we can note that Wx equals W times the sine of theta. Also, Wy, since it's the adjacent side, simply equals W times cosine of theta. Now, as far as directions, let's observe the following. Wx, from this point forward, will always be directed towards the bottom of an incline. What about WY? WY will always be directed downward along the y-axis. Let's also note the proper directions as they relate to the rotation of the Cartesian coordinate system. So from this point forward, if you're traveling along the x-axis, that's not considered up. That's considered traveling to the right. So the direction for positive x is considered to be motion to the right. Along the negative x-axis, that motion is considered to be left along the positive y-axis that 
direction is up and of course along negative y that's considered the downward direction so that's for what we will be referring to in terms of directions whenever we refer to an inclined plane now this work that we've performed is very very important whenever we consider inclined plane analysis and so I'm going to put it in a blue box and we generally refer to it as prep work for inclined planes and so whenever we consider an inclined plane in the future the first thing that we'll be doing or one of the first things that we'll be doing is using this information in order to process the problem we will now introduce the subject of friction whenever two surfaces interact with one another the interaction will produce two forces which will oppose the translation of one surface against the other these forces are called friction the symbol for friction is F and of course the units well since friction is a force the units are the same as all other forces namely Newtons in the SI and pounds in the British system we will primarily be using the international system in our examples and by the way this is a small case F we reserve small case F for friction we will now examine the role that friction plays when somebody's walking across the floor and in this example we have somebody whose right shoe is in contact with the floor the left shoe is obviously elevated and so there will be friction present between the sole of the right shoe as well as the floor and there will be two forces of friction in other words the floor will exert friction upon the sole of the right shoe and the sole of the right shoe will exert friction upon the floor the first question is what is the direction of the force that the shoe exerts upon the floor and we can gain an insight into this answer by considering a banana peel so if we introduce the banana peel underneath the right shoe and the person let's say tripped which way would the banana peel be ejected and our intuition suggests that the banana peel would be ejected leftward that means that the shoe is exerting a leftward force onto the banana peel and therefore we can conclude that the shoe also exerts a force that is directed to the left upon the ground so we can represent that force by drawing the floor and then showing that the shoe exerts a leftward frictional force like so now the question is what is the direction of the force 
the frictional force that the ground exerts on the right shoe. And the answer to that could be found by applying Newton's third law, which states that any time two objects interact, there will be the existence of two forces that are equal in magnitude but oppositely directed. So if the shoe exerts a leftward force on the ground, according to Newton's third law, the ground will exert a rightward force on the bottom of the shoe. And we can represent that by drawing the shoe like this. and representing the friction as a right bound force. It's also important to note that the ground exerts the normal force as well and we can indicate that with an arrow as well as the symbol for the normal force. So again the ground exerts two forces for this example on the right shoe the force of friction is directed to the right and it also exerts a normal force that's directed upward. Now you may be wondering what the force of friction depends upon and here's the answer to that question. The force of friction depends upon two things. First of all, it depends upon the materials that are involved. It also depends upon the normal force that exists between the two surfaces. In other words, it's very important to know whether this student has rubber soles or whether they're wearing skis made out of wood. In the case of a rubber sole on top of a concrete floor, the force of friction will be relatively large. On the other hand, if we're wearing skis made of wood and the surface is, say, packed snow, the force of friction would be far, far less. So the materials play a critical role in determining how much friction will be present. Also important is the value of the normal force. So the greater the normal force, the more friction that will be present between the two surfaces. So if we compare the amount of friction between somebody who is light, let's say, where the normal is relatively low, versus somebody who is heavier, where the normal is higher, the heavier person will actually develop more friction between their shoe and the surface uh, versus the lighter person who will develop less friction. So we will now incorporate these two factors into an equation. And here is the equation for friction. Friction equals mu times n. Now you recognize n as being the normal. The question is what is this symbol mu representing? Uh, before I discuss that, make sure that you recognize this is the Greek letter mu. It has a long leg at the beginning. Uh, it looks like the letter u, but it's the letter mu. And so make sure that you draw it differently than the letter u, which will be reserved for other things later on in the course. Mu is a way of accounting for the type of material. Mu is called the coefficient of friction. And the value from mu is tabulated within the textbook. So please open your textbook to the appropriate page. There's a table that shows the coefficient of friction for different materials. And in that table, you'll note that there are two different values for uh, any given pair of materials. One of them is called mu sub s. And s stands for static. So this is called the static coefficient. The other one 
is labeled mu sub k, which is called the kinetic coefficient. So what's the difference between the two? Mu sub s is used to determine the friction when the surfaces are static in relation to one another. In other words, they are not translating against each other, they're not skidding against each other, they remain static. Uh, as an example of that, when someone is walking, their shoe remains static while in contact with the surface. And so, under those circumstances, we would apply the static coefficient. So, let's just summarize the static coefficient as being applicable when there is no translation between the surfaces. On the other hand, if there is translate, uh, translation, such as when someone slips, or let's say in the case where the drive tires of an automobile are spinning out. In that case, the surfaces are translating against one another, and the amount of friction that will be available is actually less than would be available under static conditions. And so, we use the kinetic coefficient when translation is present. And you should also note that, I guess, a synonym for the word translation would be skidding or rubbing. So when the two surfaces are translating, they're either skidding against each other or rubbing against each other. In other words, one surface is moving against the other surface as opposed to remaining static or in place. So that's what I mean when I use the word translation. Let's now compare the static and kinetic coefficients of friction for a situation involving rubber on concrete. Let's imagine that somebody's wearing rubber-soled shoes and they're walking along a concrete pathway. So long as the shoes are not slipping against the concrete pathway, the coefficient of friction is relatively high. It has a value of 1, which means we have a lot of friction available for us to maintain our walk. On the other hand, let's say we apply a very large force that causes the shoes to slip. While the shoes are slipping, the coefficient of friction drops down to 0.8, and so we have less friction available to maintain our stability. Let's now imagine that we're in our car and we're pressing the accelerator pedal. So long as each segment of the tire, and let's just emphasize a particular segment. So long as this segment right here of the tire comes into contact with the ground and then lifts off without skidding or without slipping, that interaction between this portion of the tire and the road is actually considered to be a static event. And so long as that occurs, in other words, no slipping, the coefficient of friction will equal 1, which means we have a lot of friction available towards the acceleration that can be applied, rather, towards the acceleration of the car. On the other hand, if we accelerate too hard, if we're pushing too hard on the accelerator, and this portion of the tire touches the ground and then slips, the coefficient of friction now drops to 0.8, which means we have less friction available towards the acceleration of the car. It's also important to note that when we're accelerating the car, the force of friction between the ground and the tires will be directed to the right. Also, our acceleration will be directed to the right as well. Now let's consider what happens when we apply the brakes so in this example, the brakes are applied. When we apply the brakes, the brakes will try to prevent the rotation of the tires. Now let's look at the extreme case. If we completely prevented the rotation of the tires, what will the tire do to the road as we're traveling to the right? 
Well, the answer is the tire will push the road to the right, create a frictional force that's directed to the right, and therefore, according to Newton's th uh, third law, the road will produce a frictional force against the tire that's directed to the left. So under these circumstances, the frictional force will be directed to the left. Okay, so acceleration causes a rightward frictional force like this. Let's include that. And braking causes a leftward frictional force under these circumstances. And by the way, since the car is traveling to the right, and its speed is decreasing when the brakes are applied, that means the acceleration is opposing the motion. And so the acceleration would have to be drawn towards the left under these circumstances. Again, in the above case, the acceleration is helping the speed in to, to increase, whereas the acceleration when the brakes are applied is opposing the motion of the car and therefore we have to draw it in the opposite direction. Now while we're applying the brakes which coefficient of friction will be applicable? The static or the kinetic? Well the answer depends upon whether we're skidding or not. So as long as we're applying the brakes and not causing the tires to lock up each segment of the tire will touch down on the ground and then lift off without skidding. That interaction is actually considered to be a static event and therefore we will have a coefficient of friction equaling 1 available towards stopping the car. And the larger the coefficient, the less distance will be required and the less time will be required to stop the car. On the other hand, if we do press hard on the brakes and cause the wheels to lock up, under those circumstances, the segment of the tire that's in contact with the road will skid or translate across it, and that means we will only have a coefficient of friction equaling 0.8 available towards stopping the car. That means it'll take us a lot more time and distance to bring the car to rest. Now the engineering community recognized the difference between the static and the kinetic coefficients of friction and that's what inspired the development of anti-lock brake technology. What anti-lock brakes do is they prevent the tire from locking up no matter how hard you press against the brakes and by doing so we're always providing a coefficient of friction of 1 towards stopping the car as opposed to dropping it down to 0.8. We will now introduce an inclined plane with friction application. In this example, two blocks of masses 12 and 25 kilograms are connected by light string as shown below. The coefficient of kinetic friction between M1 and the incline is 0.35 and the angle of inclination is 30 degrees. If the system starts from rest, we'll start by drawing a free body diagram for M2 and we'll also process the remainder of the problem you can see that we have a very rough incline and because of that friction will be present between the block and the incline and since we're assuming that the system will be set into motion we will be relying on kinetic friction because the surfaces will be rubbing between one another so let's draw the free body diagram for M2 which is this mass hanging off of the edge of the incline So we'll start by drawing M2, which is a 25 kilogram mass. And first we'll represent the weight, right? Every mass has a weight. The earth is pulling straight down on this object. And so we can represent the weight like so. Of course, the weight equals the mass times gravitational acceleration that's 25 times 9.8 which equals 
245 newtons for the weight. What other forces are acting on this mass? Well, it's certainly tied to a string, and the string is exerting a tension, so we'll represent the tension as an upward force, right? The string is pulling up on this mass. So we'll represent the tension this way, and now the question is this. Which way will this mass move if we release the system? Will it move downward, or will it move upward? We will just guess that the system moves downward, and if we are right about that, then the resulting acceleration will be positive. On the other hand, if we guessed wrong, then the resulting acceleration will be negative, and that means we will have to start the problem from the beginning. So let's hope we're making the right choice. So we will represent that the acceleration is directed downwards, and this completes the free body diagram for M2. In part B, we want to determine the relationship between the tension and the acceleration for M2. We will determine that relationship by applying Newton's second law. And Newton's second law tells us that if we add the forces, in this case the forces are directed along y, so we will add the forces in the y direction, we will either get 0 ma or minus ma. And the question is, what is the appropriate choice? Well, we always go to the free body diagram in order to make that choice. In the free body diagram, the acceleration is pointing downwards, and so we will choose negative ma in this case. So the guiding equation is the sum of the forces in the y equal minus ma. Now the question is, how many fingers are we going to extend from the summation? There's going to be one finger for every force directed along y. And once again, the free body diagram shows us that we have two forces aligned with the y-axis, the tension and the weight. The tension will be entered as a positive value. The weight is directed downwards. It's entered as a negative value. And so we have the tension minus the weight, of course, equals 245, equals negative, the mass is 25, times the acceleration. If we transfer the 245 to the other side, we end up with the tension equaling positive 245 minus 25A. And that's as far as we can take that relationship. So we will store it in a box and move on. And also, let's label this as equation number one for future reference. We will now construct a free body diagram for M1. And that will begin by drawing a Cartesian coordinate system so that the x-axis is aligned with the incline. So here's our Cartesian coordinate system. Of course, this is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. Let's also note the directions. The positive x-axis is considered to be directed towards the right. This is the left side. The positive y-axis is upward. And the opposite side, of course, is considered to be downward. Let's also note the angle as 30 degrees. Next, let's draw the block, which is a 12 kilogram block. Here it is, and we'll also create a rough surface along the x-axis to always remind us, in this case, that friction is in fact present. And we will now incorporate the prep work for an incline that we discussed earlier. Let's review the prep work. It starts by determining the weight of the mass, then we calculate the value for Wx as well as for wy, and we also want to note the directions. In other words, wx is always directed toward the bottom of an incline, 
and WY is always directed downward along the Y axis. So let's bring this material into our problem. Okay, so in this case, the weight equals mg. We're talking about a 12 kilogram mass. The value for g is always 9.8, and that produces a weight of 117.6 newtons for the block. Next, we can calculate Wx through W sine theta. By the way, notice the reversal of what we normally see in a trigonometry class. Usually the x component is related to the cosine, but in the case of an incline there is an exception, and therefore Wx is actually related to the sine and not the cosine. So let's apply this equation. The weight is 117.6, the angle is 30 degrees, and the calculator says that the value equals 58.8 newtons. Finally, Wy equals W times the cosine of theta. Again, we have 117.6 times the cosine of 30, and the result equals 101.8. Newtons. Now we need to bring Wx and Wy into the diagram. And by the way, we're not going to bring the weight into the diagram because that will be double representation. We can either represent the weight through W or through its components, which are Wx and Wy. We don't want to introduce all three. So we prefer to represent the weight with Wx and Wy. The question is, which way is Wx directed? Well, if you recall from our prep work um, development, Wx is always directed towards the bottom of an incline. Therefore, this arrow represents Wx. Wy, on the other hand, is always directed downward along the y-axis, and therefore Wy looks like this. What other forces are being applied upon this block? Well, let's think about it. Here are two surfaces, the incline and the block itself. Anytime two surfaces interact, the normal force will be present. And therefore, we can represent the normal force that the incline exerts upon this object as follows. Here it is. And it's important to note that the normal force is always perpendicular. You can see I drew this with a 90 degree angle with respect to the incline. What other forces are present? Well, let's take a look at the original diagram. Here's the mass that we're interested in, and of course it's connected to a string, and that string exerts a tension that's directed along the positive x-axis, right? This string is pulling the block towards the top. And so we can represent the tension with this arrow, like so. What else needs to be incorporated? Well, let's not forget that there's acceleration. And we're assuming that the block's accelerating towards the top of the incline. So the acceleration will be represented by this arrow. And are we finished? Well, the answer is no. Let's not forget that friction is present. And so which way will friction be directed? Well, if the block is trying to translate towards the top of the incline, friction by nature will oppose that motion. And so the friction will be directed towards the left. And we can represent it with this arrow. So there's the representation for friction. And now this free body diagram is complete. Let's proceed to part D of the problem. In part D, we want to determine the normal force between M1 and the incline. So we need to find N. And in order to do that, we're going to apply Newton's second law along the Y direction because the normal is pointing along the Y direction. So according to Newton's second law, if we add the forces in the y direction, 
the result will either equal zero MA or minus MA. Let's take a look at our free body diagram to make this selection. You'll notice that in our free body diagram there is no acceleration vector that's directed along the y-axis. The acceleration in our case is directed purely along x. Since there's no acceleration along y, we're going to choose zero. So the guiding equation looks like this. The sum of the forces in the y equals zero. Now how many forces are there in the y direction? Again, let's look at our free body diagram. Along the y direction we have WY, see how it's lined up along the y axis, and the normal. The tension, WX, F, they are not aligned along y, so we do not consider them. We only have two forces, N and WY. Now notice that the normal is pointing upward, so it will be entered as a positive value, and WY is pointing downward, we're going to enter that as a negative value. So we'll extend two fingers from the summation. Here's our normal. Here's the value for WY, and they're going to equal zero. WY was calculated right here as 101.8. We'll transfer that over to the other side, and from that, we get the value for the normal. The normal just simply equals 101.8 newtons. In part E, we want to determine the value of the frictional force. So we want to find small case f. In order to do that, we'll just apply the friction equation, which looks like this. F simply equals mu times the normal. Now mu, which is the coefficient of friction, was given in the problem as 0.35. So this becomes 0.35. We just calculated the value of the normal as 101.8 and if we multiply those two together we get a value of 35.63. And so the frictional force just equals 35.63 newtons. In part F, we want to determine the relation between the acceleration and the tension. That relationship will be obtained by applying Newton's second law. Now, let's take note that the tension and the acceleration are directed along the x-axis, and so we will apply Newton's second law along the x-axis. And so, if we add the forces in the x-direction, we again have to make this choice. Will that result equal 0 ma or minus ma? And we will look to our free body diagram to guide us. Notice that if we're looking along the x-axis, we do have an acceleration that's directed along the x-axis, and it's directed to the right. Now, the right direction is considered to be positive. If this acceleration was directed to the left, we would have introduced it as a negative value. So because of this, we're going to choose positive MA on the right-hand side of Newton's second law. And so the guiding equation looks like this. Now the question is, how many fingers are we going to extend from the summation? Let's take a look at our FBD. Let's notice that along the x direction we have how many forces? Well, the tensions lined up along x, WX is lined up along the x-axis, and so is the friction.
So there are three forces, and let's incorporate them into Newton's second law. So we have the tension, and by the way, the tension is directed to the right, so it's, it goes in as a positive value. Wx is directed to the left, because it's always pointing towards the bottom of an incline, so it's going in as a negative, and so is the friction, because again, friction is pointing to the left as well. Those three forces will result in MA. So that becomes T minus, let's take a look at the value for W. Wx has a value of 58.8 minus, let's look up the friction. The friction we calculated out as 35.63 and that will equal our mass which in this case equals 12 kilograms times the acceleration. Let's combine these two values together and we get from that T minus 94.43 equals 12A and all we can do now is to transfer the 94.43 to the other side and that produces a result of 94.43 plus 12A. Notice that I changed the sign of the negative 94 to a positive when I transferred it to the other side. That's about as far as we can get with this second equation and so we'll store it in a box and move on to the next part of the problem. In part G we want to solve for the tension and the acceleration. And in order to do that, we just have to apply some algebra. Let's first note that this is equation number two. We also had an equation number one, so let's recall that equation. Equation number one looks like this. T equals 245 minus 25A. Let's bring that into the page. And let's just draw the comparison. We have tension equaling 94.43 plus 12A. We, we also have it equaling 245 minus 25A. All we need to do now is to set the two of them equal to one another. So we will note this procedure as equation 1 equals equation 2. And we'll write the right-hand side of each equation and so the right hand side of equation 1 is just 245 minus 25A and the right hand side of equation 2 is just 94.43 plus 12A we'll add 25A to both sides we'll do the algebra step by step and that produces 245 equals 94.43 plus 37A. Next, we'll subtract 94.43 from both sides. And that produces 150.6 And finally, we'll divide both sides by 37, and that will produce a value of 4.07 for the acceleration. And of course, the units for acceleration are meters per second squared. Now, we have some very, very good news here, and that is the result turned out to be positive. I want to emphasize that. What does that mean? The positive result means
we chose the correct direction for acceleration. So let's refer to our diagram for a moment. As you, re you may recall, we decided to choose a direction that was directed towards the top of the incline for the motion which created an acceleration that's pointing directly towards the top of the incline. Now, we were correct in that choice because the acceleration turned out to be positive. If we were incorrect, we would actually have to redo the problem. And let me show you what that would mean for us. If the acceleration turned out to be negative, we would actually have to redraw this diagram and indicate that the acceleration is directed to the left. And under those circumstances, the friction would be directed towards the top of the incline, which would be towards the right. So the free body diagram would have a reversal in the direction of the acceleration as well as the friction. And if we processed it a second time, the value for acceleration would have come out positive, but the value would have also been different than what we just obtained. So by guessing properly, we avoided having to redo the problem. Let's now calculate the value for the tension, and that's just a one-step process. By knowing the acceleration, we could just use either equation 1 or equation 2 to determine the value for the tension. So let's use equation number 2. which states that the tension equals 94.43 plus 12A. We're going to apply that equation now. Of course, our acceleration equals 4.07, and if we enter these numbers into the calculator, the tension equals 143.3 newtons. In the last part of the problem, part h, we want to find the velocity at a time of 3.5 seconds. In order to do that, we will apply the motion in one dimension equations. Let's take inventory of what we know. We just determined the acceleration. The acceleration equals 4.07 meters per second squared. We know the initial velocity equals zero because the system starts from rest and we also have knowledge of the time. The time equals 3.5 seconds. Let's now take a look at the motion in one dimension equations. Here are the equations and let's evaluate the first one. We're looking for velocity. We have knowledge of the initial velocity. We know the acceleration. We know the time this is the equation that we will be applying. So V equals V0 plus AT. The acceleration equals 4.07. The time equals 3.5 seconds. And that results in a velocity of 14.25 meters per second for the system. Now, that's the velocity of each of the masses, and to be technically accurate, the velocity of m1, and let's take a look at that for a moment, here's m1, the velocity we just obtained will be considered to be positive for m1 because m1 is traveling towards the right, and it would also be considered to be a negative value if we're uh, applying it to M2, which is traveling downward along the y-axis.
In solving this problem, we applied a process which I would now like to summarize. So, whenever friction is included within a free body diagram, the following procedure should be applied. I sometimes refer to this procedure as the three-step method because it has three steps. Step one is an application of Newton's second law along the y-axis and so we will apply step one as the sum of the forces in the y equals 0 ma or minus ma and I should say that typically the choice is 0 because usually the object is not accelerating along the y direction but there are exceptions. The second step is the application of the friction equation which is F equals mu n. Finally we will apply Newton's second law in the x direction and of course we have to make the decision of 0 or ma or minus ma for the right hand side and that concludes this lecture